but only increased nationalist support. When de Valera left for America, he was the leader of Sinn Féin and the IRA, and he was the leader of the whole revolutionary movement. And when he came back, Michael Collins was the leader of at least the military wing of the revolutionary struggle. And I think de Valera had difficulty dealing with that. At Christmas 1920, de Valera was smuggled back to Ireland, and one of Collins's associates went to greet him off the ship. Mr. de Valera said, how are things going, Bat? And Bat O'Connor replied, Mick has everything in control. They haven't an idea where next they're going to be struck. And the big fella, he said, is still in total charge, fit and well. And he told Michael the following night that Dev slapped his hand off the rail of the ship. We'll see in the future who's the big fellow, he said. It was more than jealousy that divided the two men. They disagreed profoundly over military strategy. De Valera disliked Michael Collins's brand of urban terrorism. In May 1921, he committed the IRA to a traditional military action, an all-out attack on the Dublin Custom House. It was a disaster. The Dublin IRA were utterly routed. Nearly 80 men were captured and five were killed. Collins was furious. And yet the attack increased the pressure on the British government to end the messy conflict on Britain's western flank. In 1921, the Prime Minister Lloyd George agreed to call a truce. There was an atmosphere of fevered anticipation as de Valera set off for Downing Street. He seemed poised to deliver an Anglo-Irish treaty that would give Ireland true self-government and then return to lead the new nation. Yet what followed was infighting and a squalid war of Irishmen against Irishmen that wrecked the economy and blew apart his own political career. He had uh, this kind of Catholic scholastic mind of that time, which uh, certain kinds of English people in particular would find maddening. Uh, Lloyd George famously remarked, negotiating with de Valera is like trying to pick up mercury with a fork. And when de Valera was informed of this, he grinned and he said, oh, why doesn't he try a spoon? Lloyd George offered to create an Irish free state, giving Ireland the status of a dominion like Canada. But de Valera knew his supporters wanted a full republic and would regard anything less as a sellout. It's fair to say de Valera knew that compromises were going to have to be made and he didn't want to be the one to make them. When they discussed uh, sending a delegation, de Valera told the cabinet, we must have scapegoats. De Valera would send others to make concessions in the bruising negotiations with Lloyd George. From his aloof position in Dublin, he could then add some of his own Republican finishing touches to the treaty and emerge with his presidential reputation untarnished. Michael Collins was pressed to join the delegation. Michael refused to go. He argued very strongly and very forcefully would have. But he was persuaded to go. I'm set up, he said. And you know bloody well he's setting me up. But things did not turn out as expected. Collins and the delegates went ahead and signed the treaty. Ireland would stay in the Commonwealth, and the recently devised partition of Northern Ireland would be confirmed. And it was all concluded without reference back to de Valera. Collins, through 
the, the, the strange kind of circumstances of the treaty, had become the first person in Irish history ever to be able to come back and say, we've got a state. And I think de Valera, in his own mind, had always figured himself out to be that person. The gap between the two men widened. The difference focused not on Irish partition, but on the oath of allegiance to the British crown that the Free State Parliament would have to swear. That little sentimental thing, de Valera called it. But the fight over it split the IRA into two factions and ushered in civil war. Dublin's Four Courts building was occupied by hardliners who would never accept an oath of allegiance to the British King, and de Valera was their figurehead. They were pounded with shells, this time not by the British, but by Michael Collins and the forces of the newly won Free State. The war of brother against brother had begun. The Irish Civil War was more brutal and destructive than the last three years of conflict with the British had ever been. Hundreds died in the villages and country lanes. This time, de Valera was on the losing side. Though he was still the political leader of the anti-treaty forces, they increasingly ignored his attempts to negotiate a solution, and power passed into the hands of the military commanders. He had helped to start the war. Now, marginalized and exhausted, he could only watch as atrocities were committed by both sides. Now it was Michael Collins who seemed to be assured of victory, that his potential dazzling future as Ireland's leader was about to be snuffed out. In August 1922, de Valera was in County Cork. A group of IRA men were planning an ambush. De Valera pleaded with them not to do it. Michael Collins's convoy passed through a narrow glen at Bilna Blaw. A bullet smashed into his temple. He died on the roadside verge. When Collins was killed by the IRA, de Valera had tried to dissuade them, but he was told to mind his own business as an ordinary soldier of the Republic, and therefore and not, and, and not any important figure as far as the military hierarchy was concerned. De Valera had no authority one way or the other. He couldn't have done anything. De Valera probably did carry around in his own head a certain amount of guilt about his own role in the Civil War, about his own uh, use of Collins and, and the fact that he pushed Collins forward as the person to make the compromise and then didn't, didn't stand behind him. Held in solitary confinement for 11 months after the war, de Valera's political career seemed emphatically over. But he sensed a political vacuum in war-ravaged Ireland and planned to win back the disillusioned public with a brand new political party that he would control. How de Valera emerges from the end of the Civil War and within nine years is in government is an astonishing story, and it shows really all his political skills. By 1932, he was in power, and he stayed there for the next 16 years. De Valera's journey, actually, in some ways, is the journey of contemporary Irish history because uh, de Valera did move from a kind of hardline extremist rhetoric, uh, extremist use of violence, an absolutist kind of position that, you know, we want the Republic or nothing. And he moved from that, actually, to be the great compromiser, to be the great politician. Um, as soon as he got into power, uh, he turned out to be a very astute and, and able um, political figure. And in a sense, he set a pattern for, for subsequent Irish history. As he moved from gunman to statesman, he banned the IRA and came down fiercely on his old hardline comrades. Many Republicans do regard him as, as someone who betrayed the Republic. And, you know, there's a lot of bitterness about the fact that Republicans were executed in, in the South, and that Damon de Valera eventually turned out to be more vicious against the Republicans than many other, you know, even British leaders at many different times of, of Irish history. He was the greatest twister and the greatest traitor in Irish history because he had uh, men in jail. 